to this cultural evening on the eve of the sixth annual assembly of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. These cultural events have become an integral part of the activity of our organization, which has dedicated itself not only to the establishment of a chair of Armenian studies at Harvard University, but also to the advancement of Armenian studies throughout America in general. The theme of the panel this evening is the Armenian in America, his history, achievement, and problems. Emigration for Armenians is not new. The vicissitudes of history, the enterprising spirit and the commercial activity of the people has taken them to many parts of the world from the beginning of history. And America is not an exception. The Armenian in America is not a new phenomenon. We could not tolerate to be outdone or preceded anywhere. We got there at the time of Noah. We got here one year before the Mayflower, <laughs> if we can believe the record of the sovereign state of Virginia, which mentioned a Martin the Armenian as early as 1618 and 19. Apparently, at that time, people were having even more difficulty with Armenian names than they're having now. And apparently the Virginians were more notorious than others because some 40 years later, they, the Virginia records again refer to another Armenian, this time George the Armenian. From Mardiros to Kevork, or Martin to George, and subsequently to many others. We find them leaving their trace on American history in a very modest way indeed. However, as early as these immigrations were, they did not constitute a real immigration, and the first ripple of an Armenian influx was begun in, 18, in the 1830s under the impact of American missionaries in Turkey. Having come into contact with these men and women, many Armenian young men became interested in pursuing their education on the shores of the new continent. Hence, there was a, an almost uninterrupted line of students as tenuous as the line was. And it is said that from 1834 to 1894, some 5,000 Armenians made their way to the shores of America. Then came the big wave of immigration from 94 to 1914, when, according to the information we have, more than 70,000 Armenians escaped from Turkey and various parts of Asia Minor to establish themselves here permanently or uh, temporarily. You know the rest. An immigration wave in 1921 and a smaller one in the post-Second uh, World War period. We are here to find out tonight what these Armenians have done in their new homeland. And we have asked a group of distinguished panelists 
who have achieved an important place in their chosen fields to discuss various aspects of Armenian life in the United States. Now it is said that in 1880 there were some 40 Armenians in Massachusetts and that in 1895 there were nine in Boston distributed in the following way. Two students, one artist, one storekeeper, one rug merchant, one machinist, one copper worker, one jewelry worker, and his wife. Well, things have changed considerably since then. And we are going to have the pleasure of hearing from a man who is very well acquainted with one particular phase of the manner in which Armenians have been earning a livelihood in the United States. This gentleman calls himself a retail of men's clothing, and I am sure you will recognize him, especially by the unusual advertisement that you have seen in the Boston papers. He says he's a graduate of Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Moreover, he is half Kharpetsi and half Bolsetsi, an ideal combination. <laughs> and finally, to give him a special characteristic, a, a more, even more distinctive characteristic, he says he is Arlene Francis's boyfriend once removed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Zari Tamaji. Dr. Akhmachin, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Armenian chair, don't be too hard on the committee. There are other selections, I think, of very high grade. The fact is they tried very hard to get a real big shot in this spot as a representative of Armenian business. They weren't very successful. They asked Charlie Kazanjan in New York, and I guess he's knitting himself another rug, <laughs> kind of busy. They asked Mr. Gulbenkian, and he said he didn't think his horses could take the trip. <laughs> they even asked Steve Mugar, but I guess he's opening a dairy freeze somewhere in Methuen tonight, so. <laughs> I'm not sensitive, you see. Uh, I don't get opportunities like this very often. I'm delighted to perform. In fact, uh, I had high hopes for this talk I was going to give you. I wanted to make this a very intensive, a very extensive, I thought even a penetrating study of the Armenian businessman in America. Of course, I had no intention of writing this speech myself. The, uh, I intended to turn that over to my secretary. You see, businessmen are more or less like TV artists today. There's a little bit of payola <laughs> in all aspects of the American economy. And I have a very lovely secretary and a very bright one, quite literate. And uh, as I say, I had great hopes, except that in this in this cloud that I was in when I was first honored with this gracious invitation, I uh, heard the word seven minutes. And uh, I turned to Mr. Dermanuelian, who was otherwise a very lovely fellow, and I said, what did you say? He said, seven minutes and no more. <laughs> so if this is rather a cursory study, of the subject in hand, uh, please blame Mr. Dermanuelian and not me. I wish I, uh, I could tell you that the Armenian imprint on American business was a very dramatic thing, a very great thing, and a very illustrious thing. But if I must speak from my own experience, I would say that that was not the case. 
We don't have many billionaires. Actually, we don't have very many pioneers in business. We have some dramatic successes. You've heard of them, Mr. Karagersian, Mr. Stephen Mugar in New England. Oh, there's quite a few, and this is not going to be an anthology. But our imprint has been rather a matter of depth rather than height. I think the Armenian businessman in America has left its imprint in numbers. For, a, for an immigrant people, it seems to me the density of our small successes has been considerable. And I'm rather proud of it. In fact, I would wager that half or more of the people here have parents or relatives who are small tradesmen in America. My father was a small tradesman, and I used to think his success was a very small one. But the older I get, the more I realize how great his success was. And he was only one of thousands. The Armenians in America actually opened thousands of shops, stores, small manufacturing plants, small service industries. And while this in print doesn't make for a fantastic story or a remarkably dramatic story, I think it's worth considering as a great story, nevertheless. The Armenian contribution in America, in my opinion, in business, has been really one of sweat and ours. Our fathers and grandfathers were really the scabs of retail and manufacturing distribution. I hate to get into my family again, but it illustrates a point my father had a store in Worcester, and he opened at 7 in the morning, and he closed at 10 at night, six days a week, except Saturday, when he closed, when the police closed him, which was usually 20 minutes past 12. I always remember the police coming in Saturday night and saying, Charlie, it's against the law. Close. He'd say, go up to Shacks and close him. Go up to Ligham's and close him. Open as long as the law would allow. When you say, what's great about that contribution? Well, possibly nothing great in the specific instance, but thousands of Armenians were doing the same thing. They were opening little shops, and sh by sheer industry and long hours, they were establishing themselves and providing for their families. Well, as I say, I thought that was rather a mean success as a youngster, but after many, many years of living, I realize now that with the language barrier and the cultural barrier, that was a great success, not only for my dad, but for the thousands of other Armenians who started the same way. The Armenian businessman in America had a hard time, because not only he had no money, not only did he not know the language, but the way Armenians did business in the old country was so different from the way it was done here. And until he learned, it took a lot of doing. The, uh, I haven't been in the old country, so possibly I am a little bit beyond my depth, but I've discussed the matter with people who have been, and evidently we do business here a lot differently than was done over there. And some of our fathers and grandfathers had a hard time adjusting themselves to the American way, but they adjusted, and they adjusted exceedingly well. As I say, I'm rather proud of their record. As I say, we have no Texas millionaires, and we have no Macy, maybe, and no Gimble. But we have, I think, for our population, a great success story of small merchants who, by terrific work, patience, and toil, carved for themselves and their families a place in the American scene. 
I had an uncle, I don't know what he was, see, relationships get a little involved with me, but I guess he was an uncle, he could have been a great uncle, who died in South Boston a couple of years ago. In fact, his name was the name of our learned Dr. Parsekian, who is also one of the speakers. He had a variety store in South Boston, I don't know when he opened it, I think it was possibly after the Spanish War. He was there for 40 or 50 years. He died when he was 83 years of age. And uh, the last three years, he took it easy. He still ran his store. But the last three years, he closed at 10 o'clock at night. Up to that time, he was open till midnight, every night of the week. Now you say, what are you so proud about of that? What's there to be so proud about an 18-hour day? Well, I am proud that our parents and grandparents had the, had the courage and the patience and the will to carve themselves a spot in the American business picture in the only way they could, which is by superior toil. It sounds banal, it's not very dramatic, but when you think of the thousands of small successes our people have made in this economy, I think it's a great tribute to our Ar Armenian perseverance. The, uh, I don't know what the future will be for the Armenian businessman in America. Oh, incidentally, when I talk about these small successes, I hope you won't think that all our successes were small ones. We have, I know, and you know, many big ones, but basically the pattern of our success has been density. I don't know what the future holds for us, but I at least have a hope that now that we have more or less carved a place for ourselves in the business scene, that that we will use that opportunity for a little growth in our thinking. Now, these are all personal views, so I hope nobody will quarrel with them. You know, I, hope, I don't mind if you disagree, but it seems to me that the Armenian businessman in America has been primarily a tradesman and very rarely a businessman. Now this, I don't mean in an unfriendly light at all. We are tradesmen by instinct, I think, just as I think the Greeks are and the, the Jews are. Incidentally, that business about 10 Greeks to one Jew and 10 Jews to one army, and I think is the, is the greatest hogwash in the world. We are not a particularly brilliant group of businessmen. We just work harder than our competition. That's all, it's just that, harder work. But as I say, now that we have achieved a small success in this country, now that we have so many thousands of businessmen who have provided for their families, and educated their children, I hope they will look in the future with a little larger viewpoint that they have in the past. As I say, I hope not that we all become chain store owners like Mr. Mugar or have tremendous factories that isn't what I mean by a larger view. But I hope that we have a little more <coughs> uh, social viewpoint. I don't say the Armenians are antisocial, but it seems to me that it has been so difficult for us to make a success in business that we have forgotten what success is for. As I say, our past has been, I think, a very, very illustrious one. I simply hope that in the years that are ahead, the Armenian businessman in America will uh, be more conscious of his social obligations, not only to the Armenian community, but to the American community of which he is such an integral part. Thank you. Mr. Tomagen has reminded me indirectly that I too am under pressure by our uh, very zealous chairman 
to uh, keep within time limits. I already uh, feel, him tug uh, feel him tugging at my coat. Uh, therefore, after my initial exuberance and expansiveness, I think I had better begin to talk faster and less. It seems that our, the, the first scientific contribution of Armenians to American life was made by a medical doctor who was called Christopher Der Seropian, whether that was Christopher Der Seropian or some other uh, name I do not know. But he has been credited with the discovery of the black and green colors which are even now used on the American paper currency. Things are considerably different today. We have many, many more people in the scientific field, not only in the academic phase, but also in the industrial. And we have a gentleman here tonight who is going to tell us a little bit about the Armenian contribution to American science. He is a man who spent a few years in a neighboring institution in this very town, namely the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he received his Bachelor of Science degree. He went on, climbed the academic ladder to get his PhD at New York University, and later, for a period, he became director of research, the research division of New York Operations Office of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Now, he is Dean of the School of Engineering and Professor of Nuclear Engineering, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute at Troy, New York. I had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time at an ASA banquet and convention in 1951 when he was honored with the Kabakchian Award for outstanding contribution to the field of science. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dean Lawrence Barcerian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and friends. I'm rather pleased that the first talk began as it did. I was afraid we were going to start bragging about ourselves and and find ourselves over-enthused. But we didn't, and I appreciated the nature of what we've heard. The Armenians are doing pretty well financially, and that's good. You've got to be reasonably well settled before you go, one goes to the next stage. And so the question that we are addressing ourselves to is, how is he doing in the professional world, in science? in medicine, as a, uh, not as a lawyer, I wasn't asked to comment on the lawyer, but the, uh, the engineers, the scientists, and the medical people generally. Uh, in the first place, as far as mental capacity is concerned, I think that the Armenian does very well, as you people know uh, from your own family lives. His inclination is fairly strong toward the professional. And here I'd like to draw a distinction between professional life and the academic scholarship and pure science. There is a difference. For example, I did what is called research last evening. I took the yellow pages of the telephone book <laughs> and I counted the names, uh, those that were honest to goodness IAN. Uh, I would have missed Mr. Tomajan in that connection. But looking at the names and counting the total, uh, I found quite a few uh, medical people, physicians and surgeons uh, in this area, and one out of a hundred with the clean-cut IAN uh, is an Armenian. This is a higher percentage than his, the ratio of his uh, numbers to the numbers in the country at large. That is, there may, I, I think there's probably about one uh, Armenian to 600 uh, of other kind in this country. 
And so one in a hundred among the uh, medical people is quite good. In general science and engineering, also the ratio uh, seems to be higher. At my own institution, it's uh, about one and a half times as good as the numerical ratio would indicate. Now, with regard to numbers and productivity in the professional field, I think that the Armenian profile, professional profile, is difficult to distinguish from the profile of the country at large. It's completely a part of it. And this is good. On the other hand, there is a little difference when one comes to high scholarship for its own sake, pure science for its own sake. Here there is not quite so much money uh, as the professional person uh, tries to achieve. And here I'm not sure just where we stand. I do have this conviction that the capacity of the people for this kind of thing is far greater than the achievements of the Armenians. And it would be interesting to see just what, why this is. Uh, I have the feeling also that this is probably true in the Armenia of the Soviet Union, although I don't have much to base this on. Now, how does one develop academic genius? Well, in the first place, genius just doesn't come too often, and one in 600 would not give us uh, our ratio, would not be too many, so that we're at a disadvantage there in counting geniuses. But the problem is one of inspiring to the maximum of one's mental and spiritual capacity. And I think that in this connection, we have uh, something uh, yet to attain. Now, the, unfortunately, the same thing can be said about almost any group of people, that the inspiration toward the, these particular values uh, is not cultivated in the schools, for example. We just are not doing the job we should do in the schools, neither in the secondary schools nor in the colleges. And this is a serious problem, problem of motivation, problem of uh, reducing all the information that's available from science into something that the student can take in and find inspiration from. Uh, this is a handicap that the world is suffering from, and I think that this uh, is a handicap that also bothers uh, the Armenians. Uh, but in the case of uh, the Armenian, as in the case of the others, the utilitarian value of things uh, is considered. And so the professional life uh, tends to be favored over the academic world, which uh, does offer, require some sacrifice. Now, I think that in addition to the handicap or lack of inspiration that comes from the school, the Armenian has some additional handicaps. And the... Uh, one major handicap has been that uh, he's just been too busy trying to survive uh, for so many generations to have too much value for uh, things uh, pertaining to high scholarship and spiritual values and so on. His spiritual values were high but uh, focused around things that helped him to survive. And this was absolutely necessary. And this step into the professional life in the numbers that have gone into it was an absolute necessity. We had to achieve this today. And so now, however, we have had uh, a couple of generations of peace and opportunity to go into professional life, and we've made the most of that. And now the question is, how are we set to take the next step where achievement of high scholarship for its own sake in the sciences and other things is going to become valued more highly than we have valued it thus far? In this connection, I think we ought to think of the Armenian temperament. By temperament, he's stable enough and of dependable character, and he's capable of assuming considerable responsibility toward the problems of mankind. He has mental ability and strong individuality and personality and character, which cannot be easily covered uh, under a bushel. Nevertheless, the Armenian is essentially a conformist. And as a conformist, he 
runs no risk of trouble with the law. But conformism is deadly to genius and progress in, in the basic sciences particularly. Uh, in fact, in basic science, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish conformism from mediocrity. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? <laughs> but now, the arts and spiritual values are the springboard from which some of this free spirit and the questioning mind uh, springs forth and reaches for the tradition of high scholarship, uh, both in science and in other areas. The question is, is this a weakness that we now have? And I think it is. It is a weakness if one has not achieved one's full stature. It is something to be helped, changed. What can we do about this thing? I think that it is rather important for groups such as this to begin to assess the values that this group would place on high scholarship for its own sake, academic scholarship for its own sake. We don't have enough people in colleges, and fewer still people in colleges who are deeply interested in fundamentals. How do we encourage this? And this, I think, becomes a problem of not what you're going to do. As I look on the uh, audience, I find that the majority of us are pretty well settled. Such culture, such scholarship, and so on, as we're going to achieve, uh, we're struggling with, and we've achieved a pattern of life. And so we're all set, uh, for good or for ill. On the other hand, I wish that there were many more of the much younger in the meeting that concerns itself with culture or whatever you want to call it. And I'd like to uh, address a very strong question to the group that's sponsoring this. Where are the young people who are going to be enjoying this culture that we're talking about? Uh, I think the youngest one here is my own daughter of 16. <laughs> and that's not enough. We need many more daughters of 16 and boys of 16 in groups of this sort. And I'm impressed that the value that will be assigned to scholarship in the future by these children who are growing up will be in, uh, determined in large part by the value you place on it before them in your own home, in the evaluation you give to scholarship, science, and contributions in this very major area. Thank you. I had about that much time, I think. Before continuing the program, I do wish to say that if the accommodations tonight are not the best in the world, it is not because Harvard has been unwilling to grant us the best of quarters, but because this happens to be an extremely busy weekend at Harvard University, and this was the best they could do for us. Our next speaker is going to speak to us about our contribution to the field of music. She is indeed well qualified to treat the subject. As you will see from the fact that not only was she a graduate of Lowell, Lowell State Teachers College with a BSE in music, but that subsequently she became supervisor of public school music in one of the communities in Rhode Island, later conductor of the Armenian National Choral Society of Boston. She has given concerts in Boston, Worcester, Providence, Philadelphia, and New York, and has had radio and television appearances as well. 
she has recorded for Colombia. She has traveled through Europe and the Near East, visited Armenian communities in Paris, Istanbul, and Beirut. And since her return from her travels, she has given illustrated talks on what she saw and heard in those communities. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Ms. Siranus Dermanuela. To have to talk about music rather than to sing it or play it is terrible enough, but to have to talk about Armenian music in only seven minutes is worse. I hope, though, that I can comply. I should like to recap the title and call it Armenian Music in America, its history, its problems, and its achievements. Under this heading, the portion marked its problems will probably bear most of the discussion, as all problems do. And yet, if the subject were really known and really accepted, there would be no problem at all. The history of Armenian music in America is obvious. It came with our ancestors and with most of us, with our own parents. Not so obvious are the achievements because first we must set some sort of standard and determine what constitutes achievement. Armenian music came to America with immigration and though immigration may date back several years, Perhaps it was not until the influx of the early 20s that Armenian music found any expression in America. This was the year when on every Sunday there were engagements, weddings, dancing, singing. The summers at that time were full of picnics with the davul, the zurna, the kemene, and the kurnata or clarinet. And for a few years this was fine, isolated gatherings, no intermingling, and with distant farms where these picnics could be held, the Zurnaji and the Gurnataji, as we like to call them, could blow away at their heart's content. But then, in time, through associates at work and neighbors, our parents mingled with other peoples and our children with other children. Then began a process of comparison in the way of language, food, we mentioned food a while ago, custom, music, dance. As soon as this came about, a certain self-consciousness developed, an uncertainty, and within ourselves, sometimes even a dislike for anything that was Armenian. The apparent reason or excuse was that everything was so different. We were so different from our neighbors. Therefore, of course, we're wrong. Theirs must be right. The basic reason, I believe, was a lack of knowledge on the part of both the native and the newcomer of differences which were perfectly normal and natural, differences in characteristics, and especially the knowledge and the acceptance of the fact that there are different cultures. As a result, soon to be lost, for instance, was the art of playing the drum with a twig in one hand, you, some of you may remember it, the special sound effect that that gives, and the stick in the other, the free-form playing of the clarinet and the violin, which we now know as improvisation, a real art, a real talent, but by the time that we learned that this was a talent, that there was a term for it, our performers had already been made self-conscious and they were made to drop an art as something worthless and not acceptable. In church music, 
As soon as our immigrant parents had a toehold in the country, they busied themselves with the establishment of a church. Church music was the source of a wealth of music coming down through the ages, even from pre-Christian times, with its own rules and laws of melody making. In the church song, too, there was improvisation and embroidered singing. Soon, the organ was introduced. One reason was to fill out the lack of large choirs. But the detrimental reason was we have to be like everybody else. Everybody has an organ. We have to have one. With the introduction of the organ and its increased use during services, not only to play with the choir, but with the deacon, with the kahana, has gone the embroidered singing, the quarter tones, and the individuality of modal singing. All now must be stilted and measured to fit the rigid shell of the organ. In the world of folk song, the expression of the peasant at work or his subtle and symbolic expressions of love, transplanted from its native soil and dressed in the uniform of Western music writing and singing, is doomed to lose its freedom, its color, and its naive purity. These, to me, are the problems of Armenian music in America, problems with which you and I and all the listeners must be concerned. During the last few years, there has been a general reawakening, a consciousness of the value of things that are folk. With it has come a reawakening in our own youth of Armenian descent. It is manifested through dance, through song, through instruments, Dance orchestras are sprouting like mushrooms, and the youth is dancing endlessly, dancing wildly. That very difference, which made the previous generation unduly self-conscious and self-effacing, is making the present generation hold uh, bold enough to the degree of exploitation. The numerous record albums with often lurid cover jackets turned out and in the name of Armenian music, makes anyone with a bit of discrimination shudder with horror. I suppose in the minds of some this might be achievement. The records are being sold, Armenian name is being mentioned. And yet, if these records were produced to induce the retaining and the perpetuating of the hundreds of dance tunes and dance steps from the various villages and cities of our parents, what a striking contribution we would be making to this wonderful country of ours. These contributions are what make America. This might be considered an achievement. In the field of performance, there is an Armenian in every field of music in America, instrumentalist, vocalist, teachers in the conservatories and public schools, Broadway stars, opera stars, symphonic players, <coughs> symphonic conductors. We couldn't attempt, I couldn't attempt to name them. Each and every one is bringing his participation to the whole music picture in America. Outstanding because they are different are two instrumentalists worth mentioning. The one Vaskin Muratyan, who plays the ancient instrument viola d'amore, and the other, Arasevanyan, who plays the old in eastern instrument, the kanon. Armenian choral groups are putting on stage to the best of their ability choral music. Church choirs with the influence of the West and the use of the organ are making heard the mu music of the ancient Badarak and the Sharagans in their modulated forms. One American Armenian musician has risen to the international fame because he took time to study, to learn, and to know Armenian music to its very roots and to its relations. He became famous after he had thrown out all his works which were following the given, given pattern, after he was confident enough to be different but not only for the sake of being different. It was because he, Alan Hovanes, 
was willing to learn and to accept the value of his native music. He no longer has a pro problem. He has achievement, which came about through study, knowledge, and acceptance. What would we think of anyone who were given a jewel, an emerald, a ruby, and because he did not know its value, he turned his back to it or tossed it to the wind? Are we turning our back to our musical culture? Our next speaker is a very familiar figure in Nasser gatherings. He's been a very firm believer in the aims of Nasser and an indefatigable worker for the realization of its goals. He tells me on his little biographical card here that he was born in the near the foothills of Mount Ararat. Like all the Armenians, he is one of the children of Adam. <laughs> and he says he came out of Noah's Ark. Now I think in the next sentence he is pulling my leg. <laughs> he says that he rode across the Atlantic on a whale. <laughs> he studied engineering in order to learn how to harpoon whales and sharks. <laughs> and when he got tired of big sea fishing, he shifted to the Olympian heights of literature and philosophy. And for years, he has been teaching American boys and girls how to follow in the footsteps of a wandering Armenian, inviting them to return to Noah's Ark and uh, to live in peace. Now, the breadth of knowledge of this gentleman is phenomenal. His reading is incredible. And those of you who have associated with him and have had the pleasure of hearing him speak on a myriad of topics know exactly what I mean. And with this confidence and with this knowledge, we have asked him to tell us about the contribution of Armenians to art in America. I present to you your friend and mine, Professor Emmanuel Varangian of Ohio State University. My friend uh, Jim asked me to call him Jimmy. I like that better. Uh, I want to say a few words in Armenian because this lady loves Armenian, I know. I still need a chess, but it's given for hockey that I still. Hokit hai hokie. Sirem kokin mer mairirin menk shat parking. Shonara galtyun yertsedestyun. My friend Jimmy gave me a kind of Jehovah complex. <laughs> By that I mean seriously that really I don't know everything and there is so much to know. This is almost a truism, and I hesitate saying this. I have been delegated to talk for 10 minutes about the arts. <laughs> the arts of, uh, in the United States, particularly Armenian contribution to the vast range of the arts 
in America. Whitehead once said that through education and deliberation, an honest ap application of our reason and conscience and love of beauty, we will descend to the depths of philosophy to discover the underlying laws and principles that operate sociologically, politically, economically, and cosmically, if you wish. I'm not exactly quoting him, but paraphrasing. Then, in our moments of inspiration and joy, we will rise to the heights of the arts. The arts, the expression, the soul, the sorrow, the power, the aspirations of man to fulfill himself to wring out of the turmoil of the tragedy and comedy of life something that is truly beautiful and deeply satisfying. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, with all my respect to the scientists, and I talk not as a scientist, but as a modest former engineer, with all my respects to engineering, with all the great discoveries and technological advance of scientific expansion, there is nothing that really reaches deep down in man and brings to the surface for life in terms of its fulfillment than the arts. This I am convinced that's why I was telling to my friend, Dr. Parsikian, that I am a renegade from engineering. That's why I am in literature and the arts. Now, America, as you know, is a dynamic, emergent, creative country. The cultural ethos, or you might say, the central mystique of our adopted land is still amorphous, but nevertheless, it's like a reservoir from all lands, all nationalities, all traditions and people have acted as, oh, as though tributaries and they have come in from Europe, from England, from Ireland, from France, from Mediterranean areas, from all over. And the confluence of these various contributions and forces have made America really a kind of assimilative generator of tremendous artistic scientific forces. Now, Ten minutes. I, I have to talk now fast in terms of as many facts I can push together, telescope them. The Armenians naturally are one of the tributaries. And they come from a very ancient past. They have a cumulative experience of at least, oh, 3,000 to 4,000 years. Now, genetically speaking, we must have gone through hell and damnation, descended down to the hellfire of torture and risen to the Olympian heights occasionally. And naturally, this cumulative experience, genetically, historically, in any way you want to take, the cumulative effect has given a richness a continuity in our culture that really is waiting impatiently for geniuses to tap the musical area, the poetic area, the uh, visual arts and the sculpting and all that. That's why, for example, 
Khachaturian son like Alan Hovannes, you might call two geniuses, sensing the, this cumulative reservoir of 4,000 years old, they wanted to tap and give voice to that wealth of material. For example, the Russians knew about this. That's why the Ippolito Ivanov's Caucasian sketches are essentially part of Armenian folk dance. Get sick to me, la 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 la. I, as a boy, we used to sing this in, our, in my little town, my village. You see? Now, the Armenians bringing that in here, as the other speaker said, what we want is to discover talent, genius. And in accordance with our tradition, we respect, like the Jews respect rabbinical tradition, we respect a mind that is creative, a mind which is good, just, and serves humanity. There's no doubt that in my mind. So we are waiting, and my plea is to find these geniuses of talents and push them to the limit. After all, all advances, are done mainly by new creative minds. In America, take for example in the field of the dramatic arts, we have brought from the past and we have heirs of that past. Let me mention a few. One of them is Ruben Mamoulian, born in Tiflis, graduate from a gymnasium, and trained in Moscow, and also trained in Paris, comes to the United States and introduces certain techniques of cinema art, particularly through color technique, and the variety of manipulation to create not only a subtlety of depth, but also a vibrancy of color and potency that when you observe some of his motion pictures, the serious ones, Blood and Sand, I saw it twice, you see the richness and through this medium you immediately sense how his unconscious and the conscious is operating in terms of past traditions of artistic sensibility and perception. There's no doubt this comes in. If I had the time, I'd show you how it does. And as a result, he has been a director, he has exerted tremendous influence. I am not hesitating stating this, though it's difficult to talk about yourself and be, because I become self-conscious. But he has actually oriented the American motion picture industry in such a way that it has been enriched by the genius of this man. Akim Tamirov, though a modest actor, but he has introduced a sense of humor, a subtlety of manipulation, in many roles he takes, as though you can see the Armenian peasant, the Armenian comedian, the Armenian tragedian, all the roles he has taken part in 50 different motion pictures. And in every one of them, if you are sensitive to the cumulative responses of the Armenian arts, you can see how he operates. The versatility of man is extraordinary. Uh, then uh, in the painting, in the visual arts, for example, uh, if you have seen um, Officer Pushman's paintings, Hosman Pushman, again, though not a painter of first magnitude, but there again he brought into the texture, into the motivation and the color composition of American painting a kind of nuance, a subtlety which is mystical, as though when you look at this color, the man is longing to enter back into the womb of his past is basically oriental and discover a kind of mystical fulfillment to be pure, to be whatever he does, to be sincerely committed to an ideal. Call it God, call it the tradition of our fathers, whatever you want to call. That tenuous, untangible, undefinable quality which you cannot find actually in any other painting with all my respects to the rich production of the young non-Armenian artist. And then uh, there's another painter, Gorky. 
Achille Gorky. I happen to know his sister. Here's another renegade like myself. He was an engineer, but he gave up engineering because he felt that there are deep compulsions in a person which cannot find their outlet through the material design and construct, though the bridge might be beautiful, though Ethel Tower very high, and both built by engineers. So he devoted himself to the creative arts, particularly abstract art, which is non-representational, which doesn't try to imitate photography, but sort of projects through the uh, a kind of imaginative leap from the, the formal appearance of things to a kind of transformal composition which tries to give a kind of abstract dimension, a meaning which is beyond the surface appearance of natural phenomena, your face, my face, the tree, the mountain. And that is, of course, a projection penetration which is not easy to do. Only extraordinary minds can do this. And then he unfortunately got um, cancer and he committed suicide. But there is a book about him and many um, galleries have bought his works. Uh, then there are many others I can, I don't have the time. Der Harutunian in sculpturing, for example. Der Harutunian again. His father was a priest. He was caught in the massacres, like myself. And he was tortured, a tortured soul who, who tries to find meaning through suffering. And yet it's a kind of suffering that doesn't yield and whine. It's a bold creator, as bold as his strokes. And if you have watched his um, sculpt, uh, his works, they seem to be Herculean, writhing and sort of trying to rise out of the ashes and affirm the importance, the absolute necessity to be alive, to be creative, and to contribute. Now, he in puts his own art in these words, and I'll finish my 10 minutes. It's more than 10 minutes. I suppose it's possible. <laughs> Sculptor, he says, is a combination of the physical, the intellectual, and the spiritual. I think of stone and wood in terms of their own growth as something living and fluid. Yet he never allows his material to dictate his forms. Rather, he spends years looking for the right piece of stone. Thus, the pillar of salt, for example, Job, and Prometheus, Prometheus Vulture, and Vulture, gain support for archaic strength from the texture of the stone in which they are carved. To be timeless, Der Harutunyan insists, to be timeless, notice. And this is typically the Armenian sense of never to yield but to become deathless in struggle of continuity. And that's why you're here. Art, <laughs> to be timeless, art must have spiritual quality. Today we tend to be too clever or too gutterish. We forget that even sex can come, can be controlled and ennobled as it is in the great voluptuous East Indian sculpture. Only when, only when, um, I, I have lost my pages, but I'll find it. The intellect dominates the emotion. Will the two work together for spiritual quality? End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, my 10 minutes. Thank you.
I must say that it is an injustice to our speakers to uh, put them within such narrow bounds. No one is more aware of that than the committee which ruthlessly but unsuccessfully <laughs> <laughs> tried to put them within bounds. However, in fairness also to the committee, I must say that we had a huge topic. We did not wish to leave out any significant aspect. We were faced with a dilemma. What to do? To seek depth in only two or three areas or to seek breadth? When you seek breadth, you are faced with the problem of time. When you seek depth, you are faced with the problem of neglecting some significant aspect. Let me assure our panelists that we are counting on our audience to probe into these topics further by asking them questions so that some more significant aspect of their subject may be brought out. We are extremely anxious to have audience participation at the end of this panel. Hence, one more reason why, why we have unjustly tried uh, to almost uh, put our panelists in a time straitjacket. Our next speaker is in the field of journalism. However, according to history, she's not the first Armenian journalist in America. There was a, a gentleman who came to this country in the 19th century called Khachadur Osganyan. Mr. Osganyan graduated from the City College of New York, became prominent in journalism as a feature writer for the New York Herald Tribune, later became the president of the powerful New York Press Club. He introduced Armenians to Americans as the Yankees of the Near East, Having done that commendable work, decided to revisit his homeland, Constantinople. And when he was there, as the story goes, he was asked by the Turkish minister how the Turks could reveal to the world Turkish, the co Turkish contribution to world culture. Osganya's unhesitating suggestion was that they build a Turkish bath in America. Needless to say, the suggestion was not taken. What was begun so auspiciously in the 19th century is being continued very capably indeed by the young lady who is now working on the editorial staff of the New York Times Book Review who has been a contributor of reviews, articles, interviews, and editorials uh, to the Times, who has written articles for such literary magazines as the Kenyan Review, the Saturday Review, Books Abroad, and The New Leader. And finally, who has authored the booklet entitled The Armenian American Writer, A New Accent in American Literature, published by the AGBU. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Nona Balakian. I'm afraid if I had known that uh, Mr. Varandian was to be a speaker, I would have 
hesitated about accepting. Uh, he has been a writer whom I have admired for many years, and I know that anything I say now will be a letdown. <laughs> um, I must apologize also for the fact that my subject is not as broad as, as it might have been, the time limit again. But aside from that, um, I would like to confine my remarks, which I've titled Armenian Values and American Literature, uh, to writers of fiction. This is not because I consider writers of fiction more important, but only that they happen to illustrate the point that I wish to make. I was in something of the same predicament when a couple of years ago I published a book with the Armenian American writer, A New Accent in American Fiction. For months afterwards, I received letters from disappointed poets, journalists, writers of autobiography, biography, belle lettres, who wondered why they had been ignored in my discussion. Others asked why had I overlooked Cyril Peter Nesesian or George Mardikian, John Roy Carlson, among others. For explanation, I only needed to remind them of the title of the study. I had chosen to limit my observation to writers of fiction. Had someone asked me further why I had chosen to deal with only writers of fiction, I should have answered simply, and the answer serves as well for tonight, that not only is the criticism of fiction a special interest of mine, but through the writer of fiction, I felt I could broach psychological and sociological questions, which immen immensely interested me as well. Thus, in studying the works of Saroyan, Surmelian, Hagopian, Bar Mr. Varandian, and many others, I hoped to learn at the same time how the writer had made his adjustment how he had managed to become a success in the literary world as that hyphenated being, the Armenian-American writer. The writer of nonfiction, unless he's writing autobiography, is usually too detached and objective to reveal his true nature. But the writer of fiction can hide nothing. His attitudes, beliefs, the quality of his imagination and understanding all are magnified, and we come to know him just as if he had answered a long and personal questionnaire. If I discovered anything from my reading of this second-generation American writers, it was that, uh, from this point of view, it was that the most successful ones were those who, without flaunting their Armenian background, had wholly absorbed, sometimes unconsciously, the values of their Armenian origin. This did not mean that they had to write about Armenian subjects, though many of them did. Most of Saroyan's plays and one of his best novels, The Human Comedy, are about non-Armenians. Yet whether or not they chose to write about their compatriots, there was an un unmistakable Armenian quality in their work which could re be related to their experience as Armenian sons and daughters. They seem to be aware of something different in their background, something essentially good and humane, which far from creating inner conflict, could be absorbed into the total personality and find expression in a new accent, an original approach. In the 25 years since William Saroyan published his first volume of short stories, we have had at least a dozen other writers who have received respectable critical attention in America. From the point of view of quantity, this is not sensational, though I'm hard put to name even one notable Greek-American, Polish-American, Hungarian-American writer within that same period. But regardless of quantity, in depth, as Mr. Tomajian said, what matters is that we have made a lasting impression on the American reading public. The very fact that the word Armenian is never omitted from the jacket copy of a book by an Armenian writer must mean that the publisher recognizes the sales value of the word. Just what does the word Armenian convey to the American public? Within my own lifetime, it has undergone considerable change. Uh, I remember that when I was in school, I once gave a, uh, a talk on Armenian history, and I began by saying that 
our history, uh, sort of apologizing, was not well known and confined to footnotes in general history books, whereupon a bright young thing waved her hand excitedly, eyes aglow with knowledge, and said she knew all about Armenia. It was where Noah's Ark had landed. Uh, the other stereotype, of course, in those days was that of the starving Armenian, which the massacres had forced on us. Later on, in the late 30s, they ca there came a drastic change in the image of the Armenian. Almost overnight, the figure was transformed from one bathed in tears to one that was whimsically gay and triumphant. It was Saroyan who had turned the trick with his gallery of good-humored, philosophical, and lovably wacky characters. Most recently, the image of the Armenian is undergoing another metamorphosis. I happened to be tuned in on a television program one evening, one of those leisurely open-end discussion groups, and uh, Truman Capote, the novelist, the American novelist, was asked what he had thought of Mikoyan during his recent visit here. Capote admitted that he was impressed by the Soviet deputy's shrewdness, and he went on to say that he had met Mikoyan's whole family on a visit in Russia and had found them all terribly clever. Then with great emphasis, he had added, but of course everybody knows that the Armenians are the cleverest people in the world. <laughs> Considering the context, I realized, of course, that what that Capote was implying in the word clever, the meaning of wiliness, diplomatic canniness, and even connivance. Uh, Mr. 5% Gilbenkian, as the prototype of the international businessman, has also helped to promote this new image. And whether this has any bearing on it or not, it was distressing to find that the most fiendish woman character in recent dramatic literature, uh, I'm referring to the visit in which the Luntz starred not long ago, was given a long Armenian name, Claire Sachanasian. <laughs> Although no reference was made to her being Armenian. Thanks. From being pitied as poor refugees, we seem to have swung to the opposite extreme of being feared. Yet, I'm inclined to think that this is only the superficial public image. To a growing number of American readers, particularly those who have some personal contact in daily life with Armenians, the word suggests something quite unlike either of these two extremes. <clears throat> I had a revealing experience a few years ago of the way in which we affect Americans. When I asked an American writer, Eudora Welty, to act as a judge of a short story contest I was helping to conduct for the Armenian Students Association. If you have had any experience with amateur contests, you can imagine my anxiety as the deadline approached. I knew Miss Welty had very high standards, and my own Armenian pride was at stake. Uh, the results of the contest were beyond belief, and I especially blessed my compatriots when I read Miss Welty's comment, she had written, these stories are a pleasure to read, real joys, most of them. They are so wise, an instinctive, deep kind of wisdom. Many are sad, but not melodramatic. They get mystic instead. And all the experimenting stories please me enormously. They are so high-spirited and impulsive a wonderful impromptu quality. They have a high natural sophistication, are wise, rather, as I felt. They are without exception tender, which is everything. The dream states and meditative states are just meat for the Armenian writers. These were mere amateur works, but Miss Welty had detected in them such virtues as wisdom, imagination, humor, high spirits, tenderness qualities one associates with the best literature, which indeed were associated with the great tradition of 19th century American literature, with Emerson, Thoreau, Melville, Hawthorne, Mark Twain, Poe. As any serious student of American literature will tell you, these are qualities all too often absent in American writing today. 
with its emphasis on cynicism, mistakenly identified with realism, with, ha with its hard urban sophistication. This is why I think when uh, the Armenian writer is at his best, with the qualities Miss Welty has enumerated, he stirs a feeling of nostalgia in the American reader. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not claiming that our writers have so far produced imperishable classics, though I'm sure that many of the books will live. The point I would like to make is that we Armenians have behind us an even longer and possibly more durable, because it's been more often tested, uh, tradition of spiritual and humanistic values than the Americans. In the face of an immutable fortune, we have fought for our faith, our principles, and even in the absence of political freedom, have sought to preserve human dignity, to reach out for the true and the beautiful. And it is not only through our cleverness, our tenacity that we have survived, it is also through that weapon, second only to courage, our sense of humor, which is a reflection of our will to live. I do not deny that we also have less admirable qualities, among them our quarrelsomeness, our deficient sense of unity, which so often negates the progress that we make, but it is the positive, the humane qualities that somehow come forward when our writers are at their creative best. To speak of another fine writer, Leon Sermelian, you may remember the excellent reception he received in 1945 with his uh, autobiographical book, I Ask You Ladies and Gentlemen. What was the real secret of Sir Melian's success? Certainly not the, simply the story he had to tell of the tragic Armenian massacres. What made the book distinctive was the quality of its prose, which was the distillation of the quality of the author's mind as character. One admired not only his style, but the philosophically and morally elevated base from which he wrote. Aware of the ideal world, unafraid to confront reality, he wrote at the book's end, quote, I want, I said to myself, to be conscious again of the earth's never-ending wonders, of the all-inclusive, ever-healing, creative Mother Earth, gracious giver and final receiver of the stuff each of us the good and the bad, the great and the small, is made of. Not to take my life for granted, but always remembering death, to experience mortality for all it's worth, as I did once as a child. That's my ambition from now on. Uh, uh, I resolve desperately I'll live again as a child, bury my nose in the good odor of growing grass. I'll hunt colored stones and roll on the sand and hug the sea. I'll watch the sun go down like a great galleon in flames and the moon cut a golden swath across the black waters. Almost a century earlier, an American writer had written in much the same vein. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. The words, of course, are those of Henry Thoreau, the New England trans transcendentalist, and his escape into Walden was, like Sir Melian's thirst for the natural world of his childhood, an expression of his urge to preserve the ideal world while still holding on to its essential reality. Or let us turn to still another writer, Richard Hagopian, in his third book, Wine for the Living, published in 1956. He wrote a melodramatic story of an Armenian family living in the vicinity of Boston, which has O'Neill-like overtones of guilt, uh, poisoned love, and hidden resentment. Uh, though Mr. Hagopian is originally, I believe, from California, he has lived in New England, and his style has a certain New England severity that is alien to the West. This, combined with psychological insight and moral awareness, enables him to offset, to some extent, the melodrama of his situation. Uh, 
There is a scene in which a young boy listens to a family quarrel in an adjoining room in which he captures the feeling of mystery, of separation. Quote, oh God, that idiot. Then there was silence. The boy held his breath. As he did, he felt a strange, mysterious thing stretching taunt and thin between himself and the people in the other room. Thinner and thinner it stretched. Finally, he heard his mother say, it is late. He did not have to see her to know that her ashen features were contorted bitterly once more, nor did he have to be in the other room to know that his uncle was before the window again, smoking, uh, smoking his shoulders twitching now and then, his eyes consumed by some deadly inner fire. <coughs> Excuse me. Though there are no similarities of plot or situation, there is in Mr. Hagopian's somber tone the same suggestion of foreboding and pervading malevolence that characterized the writing of another early American writer. I'm reminded of Hawthorne's desolate tale of moral disintegration, of the lonely spinster Hepzibah in the House of Seven Gables, if you remember, tensely waiting in the bleak old mansion for the fatal moment of contact with the outside world. At his best, Hagopian has the Hawthorne-esque intensity of feeling and involvement with the mysterious inner world of man where good and evil, love and hate are at last exposed. Without taking time to quote from their respective works, I should like to suggest a still more obvious parallel between Saroyan and America's humorist par excellence, Mark Twain. Even beyond the similarities of their colloquialism, their freewheeling manner, there are likenesses in the nature of their humor. With its youthful exuberance, unlearned wisdom, its delight in exaggeration, offhand knowledge of the finer points of human psychology. Yet there's something in Saroyan that sets him apart from other American humorists. Defying all the laws of humor, Saroyan proves that you can be funny at the same time that you're compassionate. Even as we laugh, we feel our sympathies grow. For every bit of shrewdness is properly balanced by kindliness by a tolerance based on mystical belief in human worth. I think that when American critics accuse Saroyan of sentimentalism, it is often, though I admit not always, because they're so inured to the current fashion of cynicism that they're embarrassed by any show of sentiment. I can't in the limited time take up one by one others on my list of interesting Armenian writers like Emmanuel Varandian, whose beautifully written novel, The Well of Ararat, weaves such an unforgettable spell with its knowing use of symbolism and ironical suggestion. Or of Marjorie of Sepian, whose delightful novel, A House Full of Love, I'm sure you've all read. Uh, of Peter Surian, who attempted in Miri, a mature novel of young love. Of Harry Barba, who tells an interesting, intricate story of Armenian life in Vermont in a novel published just very recently called For the Great Season. And uh, also very recently, Dr. Apelian's interesting novel, The Antiochians. But it will be evident, I think, even from the little I've said, that when he is at his best, the Armenian-American writer centers his concern like the Puritans, perhaps that's why we were called the Yankees of the Near East, on the inner world of man, on his inner need and aspiration. I refer to the Puritans because, like them, the Armenian writer bases his concern for man on sound moral values. And because I want to distinguish this from today's more common Freudian probing into man's interior being, how ironical that with all our intensive exploration of the subconscious mind, we're actually most of the time moving further and further, further away from the vital center. There seems to be, in fact, in our general literature today, an absence of center, what used to be called spirit or soul, something totally different from the term personality. 
as if the various pressures of contemporary society were slowly obliterating the concrete reality of the individual. <coughs> Though the Armenian writer, like his American counterpart, is as unrelentingly exposed to these pressures, the idealistic values of, his, of the heritage he has transported to these shores have helped so far to sustain him and to nourish his imagination. And it is my optimistic belief that he, f he can continue to keep alive this awareness, this Armenian sensitivity to the larger human concerns, that the Armenian writer can become a considerable influence for good on American literature. But uh, let us also be a little realistic. Can we truthfully expect the coming generation of Armenian Americans in America to respond as spontaneously and wholeheartedly to their background as have the generation of Saroyan and even more recently of Ms. Sepian? With the passage of time, one vital source of our national consciousness will inevitably be diminished, that of the family influence. But one hope still remains to replenish that source. We can develop a conscious intellectual interest in our past and a similar kind of concern for our present and our future. Thus, what was once only a sentimental attachment or an instinctive response can become an informed and thoughtful affiliation. And knowing what we have been, we shall better appreciate what we are. And this is, I think, where the nonfiction writer will have to take over. Writing in the English language, they will have to supply us with the knowledge we need through their scholarly contributions in Armenian letters and history. Their works will, uh, being based on fact, they'll be able to formulate a truer public image of the Armenian than has so far been projected. And I know there remains much to be done in this field. In my visit to the Columbia Library, the New York Public Library, I've been shocked consulting the card catalogs how few English translations there are in comparison to French or even German of well-known Armenian works. And I've been further dismayed to found, find how generally unavailable are those which do exist. There lies before us a huge heroic task of simple translation and publication of these translations in book form. Why not in paperback, which could be readily available to the youth? Beyond that, our history remains an ever fertile field for scholarly investigation and reconstruction. In the realization of this task, nothing can measure in importance the recent creation of the Harvard Chair of Armenian Studies. From this source will come the stimulation as well as the opportunities for Armenian scholarship in America, which in the past has lagged so far behind. And to put it in broader terms still, in the hands of our scholars may well lie the power to uphold the moral and spiritual values which have animated great literature from time immemorial. Since the founding of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, there has been the closest possible cooperation between the organization and Harvard University. In this unending quest for truth and knowledge, Harvard and the faculty of Harvard University have generously, most generously indeed, given of their time and energy so that one particular area of knowledge which hitherto has been neglected may find its rightful place in the general field of academics. 
at every important function, we have had the good fortune to enjoy the presence of an outstanding member of the faculty of Harvard University. And tonight, it is no exception. Sitting on my right, waiting for his opportunity to bring you, <laughs> to bring you his knowledge and message is a professor of history at the institution whose hospitality we are enjoying and which has become the beneficiary of that great financial gift made by the Armenian community. The gentleman is modest indeed. His work has been outstanding and abundant. And yet, when I asked him to give me the titles of his publications, he contented himself by giving me only three. I take the liberty to mention these titles because I think they are significant and they indicate the author's interest in an area which is of importance to us. The titles are The Uprooted, The American People in the 20th Century, and Boston's immigrants. He has been particularly interested in the problem of the American immigrant in general and the Armenian Americans as part of their picture have merited his time and study. And he is here tonight to tell you about the history of the Armenian immigrant from the sociological point of view. It is my pleasure to present to you Professor Oscar Handlin. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, as I sat here listening to what I found very interesting talks, it occurred to me that the committee had indeed rendered uh, all of us a considerable injustice. For uh, here in the preliminary places, as it were, were a succession of people who really knew uh, the insides of their subjects and were intimately acquainted with the community which you represent they were strictly limited in their time. And here am I, who really am an outsider and who can ask more questions than I know how to answer, but have very few answers. And I am encouraged to go on and on. Well, I will assure you that I won't go on and on. <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, limit uh, my comments to a few central points. I am persuaded to do so, not only because, as I said, I have more questions than answers, and because there's more I'd like to know about uh, than I do, but also because I'm not altogether sure that you and I, those who are inside the community and those who are outside it, are looking for the same answers to these questions. I think that we should be looking for the same answers, but I'm not sure that, to begin with at least, uh, that we are. I remember some years ago 
when I was doing research on the history of uh, immigrants in New York City, I was talking with a very old and wise politician. Um, interesting character, although not altogether an admirable type. In fact, one of the pillars of <laughs> Tammany Hall. And he knew all about immigrants in a practical way, and he really did. <laughs> and uh, he said that, that he always knew how to talk to immigrants, and it didn't make much difference which immigrants. Uh, that it was uh, fairly easy to talk to all of them in pretty much the same way. He told me there are three things you have to do. First, to tell them how long they'd been in this country, that either they were with Columbus or in Virginia in the 17th century, <laughs> or that somehow they had really belonged here from the time of the Mayflower even earlier. The second thing was to tell them how old their own culture was. There were kings in Ireland in the old days, and we had uh, bishops and stuff uh, before the uh, English were out of the woods. <laughs> and uh, our culture uh, has a distinctive, long continuing value, and so on. And uh, the third thing was to remind them of the great men they had produced and the great achievements they had made in the United States. And this, he said, was an infallible recipe, a sure way of communicating with any group of immigrants. And in a way, he was right, and he wasn't being sarcastic in what he said, and I hope I won't be interpreted as being sarcastic either, because these are the things that every new people needs to feel about itself. These are the kinds of myths that are important in developing a sense of self-respect and pride and a sense of belonging in the larger community of which one is a part, a feeling that there is a real place that belongs to the group, a feeling that one has an intrinsic contribution of one's own to make, and a feeling that somehow one is earning one's own way uh, by the character of one's achievements. And these things are all very important and I think are worth remembering and worth spelling out uh, within each group. But as I've said, uh, this is part of a construct, of a kind of myth that the group builds around itself. And there's something that's left out in this process, and it's that something that's left out that interests me more than the myth. And I think it should interest you too I think it should interest the people who are actually involved in creating the community and living as part of it. But as I said, I'm not sure it always does. And this element that tends to get crowded out of the myth, that tends to get deleted from the picture of people builds itself, is the actual story of what actually happened in the real process of leaving home and of coming to the United States and of becoming a part of American life. For that story is often not a glorious one. It's not one which is built of successes. And sometimes it's not even a happy story, although we hope it leads to happy endings. It's a story which involves a great deal of suffering. It's a story which involves mostly poor and humble people and not the great ones of the earth. And it's a story which has many elements of tragedy in it. And consequently, we don't like to think of it, any of the peoples who were involved in the process. But for the sake of true self-understanding, both on the part of 
those people who were themselves immigrants, and on the part of all Americans who wish to understand the part that immigration played in uh, American history, it's important to go beyond the myths and to examine the realities because it's only by doing so that uh, one can really understand the nature of the process that brought this particular group of people, these three or four hundred thousand of them, or the much larger group of immigrants, the 35 million of them, to the United States and gave us the kind of culture we had. Now, what are some of the things that we ought to know better about and to understand and to remember? The first of these, I think, is the causes of the migration, is the reasons why now, the uh, group, this particular group or other groups like it, uh, left uh, their homelands and undertook this long journey. And in this process of displacement, uh, there have generally been involved two kinds of reasons. I think uh, this uh, applied equally to the uh, Armenians as to many other groups. In the first place, uh, various uh, political and religious kinds of persecution. It's important to remember and to uh, keep as uh, part of the uh, consciousness of uh, our uh, culture that a large part of the population that came to make up America uh, came because it was compelled to leave uh, by the pressure of persecution uh, that uh, was rooted in political, cultural, or religious differences. And the second kind of reason that I think is a factor that I think is worth recalling is the element in pushing out uh, large numbers of people uh, that came from their simple poverty. Now, I was uh, struck with uh, what the uh, first speaker said about the traders in the Armenian community and was gratified by that element of realism in his description of what had actually happened in the economic life uh, of this group. But before these people were traders, uh, they had first been uh, laborers. A great mass of Armenians who came to the United States uh, in their first jobs uh, were uh, proletarians. Uh, they uh, stepped in, as uh, many other immigrants did, at the very lowest level uh, of the uh, labor force, and if they rose, it was by efforts that carried them up uh, from that bottommost place. And before they arrived, they had, the great majority of them, uh, been peasants uh, on the land uh, who, uh, in addition to the active persecution uh, that occasionally forced them out, lived under what was generally a condition of grinding poverty and hardship. For many people, the homeland uh, acquires a kind of nostalgic, uh, 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 beneficent appearance after they left it. Uh, but from everything we can gather about the conditions uh, in the years before they left it. Uh, they, uh, uh, they tell of uh, hardship, uh, poverty, of the difficulty of making ends meet, and of the pressure of economic circumstances uh, that compelled people to leave. So the first thing that I think we ought to know about is what there was in the situation of the 
place of origin. And that uh, created conditions of persecution and of poverty. Uh, that were the first steps uh, in migration. And uh, this is important to us as a means of connecting us with these origins, which are where the experience of the group in America actually begins. The second thing I'd like to know about is realistically what it meant to people who had been peasants, who had lived on the soil, to transplant themselves, to move uh, into great cities which were dominated by strangers who spoke strange languages, and to face the multitude of challenges that were necessary to enable them to survive. What it meant to people who knew no English, who had not really had an extensive experience of living in cities, who had earned their bread in the past from the soil and now had to work in factories, to make all the kinds of changes in personal habits and to suffer all the hardships that were involved in life in the poorest quarters of the great cities doing the hardest work that the economy demanded. And it is only when we know that starting point of their experience in America that we will be able to evaluate and judge what it actually meant for them to move upward into business or into the professions or to make the kinds of achievements that some of them have made in the more advanced levels of uh, American life. In the third place, I think we'd like to know, or I would like to know, more about the character of some of the internal social institutions in the group itself. Some of these are carried across from the old world to the new with relative ease. For instance, the family uh, seems to have a great uh, kind of durability among the uh, Armenians. Family loyalties are very strong. Uh, family disciplines are uh, fairly binding. Uh, and the various ties of kinship uh, have an enduring quality, at least by comparison uh, with uh, other groups. And these uh, elements are important uh, because they provide a kind of cushion, a kind of resource within the group that enables it to absorb the shocks of its experience when it hits up against the outside world. Now, the family, like other social institutions, begins to change after the uh, immigrant has been in American life, uh, in, Americans, uh, in the American environment for some time. But it's not easy to tell uh, just what the character of that change is. From the point of view of old people, it's described as a kind of decline. Uh, from the point of view of younger people, it's described as a kind of progress. Uh, but it, the changes, like the ability to transplant a uh, family, are a sign of some uh, 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 st uh, strengthening quality uh, in it as a social institution. And if we knew more about what actually went on uh, in the process of adjustment, uh, we would be able to evaluate this institution uh, also uh, in uh, terms of uh, its effects upon the life of the group and 
in terms of the adjustment of the group uh, to the world outside it. And finally, I think it's necessary to uh, inquire more closely into what it is about this culture of the group uh, with which you are so intimately concerned that is capable of being transplanted and capable of being kept alive uh, as a, a vital and uh, a significant element in a larger and more comprehensive American culture. We can think of culture in two different senses. Uh, first, the sense in which culture is a part of a museum. Uh, we have Egyptian culture in Boston, for instance, safely locked up in the Museum of Fine Arts. And whenever people want to experience Egyptian culture, they can go and look at it, or they can get books from the library and find it described. And there's a certain kind of satisfaction in preserving culture in that sense, and a certain aesthetic and spiritual value. But there's also another sense in which we use the term culture, and that is a sense of culture as a living, vital, changing, but nevertheless dynamic element in the life of the surrounding uh, society. Uh, this is the culture that we find uh, not in the museums, but in the homes, in the streets, in the uh, 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 good parts of the schools, uh, and uh, in the daily life of the people. Now, what does it mean to you? And I ask this as a question when you speak of preserving Armenian culture. It's a question I ask also of other groups. Does it mean preserving Armenian culture in the sense in which, in which one preserves objects in a museum? That is, something that once existed, that was important or valuable or had strength at one time, and which we keep out of an act of piety or because of some ancient value or for some similar abstract remote reason. Uh, it might, uh, the uh, answer, if it were yes, might still mean that it's worth preserving, just as those Egyptian uh, monuments are worth preserving. Or is Armenian culture uh, something more than that? Uh, is it capable of uh, applying uh, to the uh, daily experience of your uh, own life? Is it uh, capable still of uh, animating your own existence and of operating through you as a channel upon uh, other Americans with whom you come in contact? I think it's necessary to confront this question uh, as frankly and as honestly as one can, uh, because uh, your own reaction uh, to the problems you face will be influenced by your uh, answer to the question, and it's only an answer uh, that uh, you can give. Uh, as an outsider, uh, I would like to uh, see uh, you uh, explore the possibilities uh, that uh, uh, this culture may still have meaning to you and to the rest of us in that second sense. For much as uh, Egyptian antiquities may contribute to the aesthetic value of the onlooker, they are not capable really of entering into the outcome of his life. It is only when uh, the elements of a culture are brought into immediate relationships with the real problems of one's life uh, that uh, the interplay uh, between the participant, the bystander, and the heritage of earlier periods uh, can become active, creative, and fruitful. 
But to answer that question, you will have to speak uh, not out of ignorance, but out of knowledge. You can only answer it if you really know not only the myths about your culture, but the actualities of it the part that it really played, and not only in remote antiquity, uh, but in the immediate past and in the transition uh, that uh, uh, this group itself uh, made in coming to the New World. Now, this problem of defining a group's relationship to culture is not unique or particular to the Armenians, uh, or it's characteristic of almost every group uh, that uh, forms part of the complex of American life. But it does take a particularly difficult form among the Armenians uh, because there is a distance uh, between young people who are born and brought up in Boston who speak English and who have the habits of their environment and the heritage of their ancestors, uh, which is couched in another language and has its roots in a place that is far away. And it's much more difficult uh, for a young person of an Armenian family to make this kind of judgment than it is, say, for a young person uh, born in an Italian family or, or a German-American family. Uh, but the fact that it is much more difficult does not make the challenge any the less pressing. Indeed, it makes it the more serious and one uh, that uh, has to be uh, confronted even more explicitly. So these are the things that I would like to know in uh, more uh, uh, substantial form uh, than I can now find out uh, from the books and the treatments of the subject uh, that now exist. I want to know more about where the Armenians came from and why. I want to know more about the real problems, the real difficulties they encountered uh, in the process of settlement. I'd like to know what happened uh, to the social institutions uh, that they brought with them as they adjusted to the strange conditions of American life. And I'd like to know, really, as an actuality, as a living actuality, what their culture is still capable of meaning to them and to us all who live with them. I would suggest that these are questions that are worth pursuing, not only worthwhile from my point of view as a historian who is looking on to see what is happening, but also from your point of view who live what is happening and who may wish to understand yourselves better. Thank you. Before passing on to the question period, there is an announcement that I have been asked to make, namely that banquet reservations anything. Uh, it's uh, possible for someone to take the subway and move to Somerville and change his name and become something different. Uh, or to become nothing. The only thing is, I suppose, if he were really nothing and didn't belong to any group, he could never be president. But if you're not a candidate for office and just have a job and don't want to identify yourself with a group, there's no reason why you have to. So people belong to a group because they want to. They want to either for family reasons or religious reasons or for social reasons, 
for a combination of these and other reasons. Now, they continue to belong to the group uh, as long as those ties hold them, as long as they have these uh, forces that uh, tie them into the group. Uh, when these forces grow weak, uh, then they change their names and move away and become something else. So in answer to your question, I don't think that there's a given lifespan uh, that you can say that after three generations or five generations, the group will disappear. It will uh, remain uh, as it is or may even grow stronger or it will decline, depending on how large a part it plays in the life of, it me of its members. If it does something important for them, uh, gives them a sense of, of their identity, uh, gives them, uh, of, uh, uh, contributes to their uh, social, communal, or aesthetic life, uh, then they, its members will continue to adhere to it. And if not, they will drop away. Uh, Mr. Gervais? I want to ask Dean Patek a question. Uh, Dean, you said that one of the main problems that happened with our meeting you was in his uh, willingness to conform. Unless anyone go home tonight thinking that this is subject only to our meeting you, is it not true, uh, truly the problem of all universities trying to say Uh, is there any panel member who would like to uh, comment on that? I think probably that's an area where there could be uh, some disagreement, some violent disagreement. Uh, if there are any panelists who would like to speak up, why uh, they have the opportunity. Otherwise, I shall pass on to other questions. Uh, Mr. Der Manuelian had his hand raised a few minutes ago. Any volunteers on the panel? <laughs> Dr. Uh, Paisarian, would you? Yeah.
Mr. Thomason, would you like to say something uh, from point of view of your own area? Ms. Balakian, would you like to?
Mr. Manuela? Handlin, do you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, just a minute. I have seen three hands in uh, almost coming up simultaneously, and I should like to recognize those three people before going on. They are Mr. Amirian, Ms. Tamizian, and Mr. Kholigian. Uh, Mr. Amirian? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make another speech. That's all right, right ahead. <laughs> but it is a difficult question and uh, doesn't have a simple answer. The problem is this. Uh, in a group, you have successive generations with different experiences. Now, they may all want to identify with a group, but they want their identification to mean something to them, to each specific part of it. Uh, now, since their experiences are different, they therefore have different demands on it. The people who are born in Armenia, who came here, say, uh, when they were adults, uh, have well, one kind of background, and when they think of the group, their memory goes back to the place of their birth and their youth and how they grew up and everything that surrounded it. Uh, those who came when they were small, they were small children, uh, have more limited memories of what was there, and. Uh, uh, their recollections in part uh, revolve
revolve around life in this country. When you have those who were born here, or sometimes the third generation, the children of those who are born here, being an Ar Armenian to them has very little to do with Armenia, the actual place. It may have to do with a street in Worcester or a place in Watertown and with the kinds of combinations of experiences that develop there. Now, all these different kinds of people, for various reasons, may want to remain Armenians, and they may come to an organization seeking satisfactions as Armenians. But there will be the difficulty that it means different things to them because their experience has been different. And therefore, uh, they will make different demands on the organization. Some will want to use one language and some another. Some will want to preserve uh, certain cultural forms, uh, have one kind of dance and some another. And there is always a kind of conflict among the different generations in the life of these groups. But in a way, that's healthy. The uh, unhealthy sign would be if the conflicts stopped and the young people stopped coming and if the uh, organization or society or whatever it is it simply got rigid and stayed where it was until its particular members uh, 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 died or disappeared. And often in the life of a community, uh, conflict is the external sign of growth, of change. And it's hard to grow and it's hard to change, but that's a part of its life. Mr. Armesian? Chairman, I'd like to ask Professor Henley. In my own mind, I have no question at all about my own attitude or that of various members of my family or of various members of the generation born here or those who came. But I do have a question in my mind about uh, what we call the American attitude. I think I am partly uh, as much Armenian as I am American. I owe that partly to the very lovely teachers who started me in kindergarten. One of my own sisters had the experience of having the kindergarten come to the a teacher, come to the home, uh, a very irate woman to, to uh, argue that we were not to speak Armenian at home, that it was most un-American, that uh, certain things had to be cut out. My dear mother asked her whether it made any difference to the daughter's performance in school. No, she said, that is not the question, but it is un-American for you to come here, live here, and not be speaking English all the time. Uh, there was no question in our mind of Americanism. I'd like to know, what is the attitude of what we call the American? Uh, you spoke uh, a few minutes ago about the Armenian in contrast to the American. I'm not quite sure what American means. To my own students, I never say, you uh, Jews, you French, you Armenian. I say, is that an Armenian name? Is that a Hebrew name? I do not say, are you a Hebrew? And I'm not quite sure what the American is. And I'm not quite sure that the American knows what he expects of the newcomer. And I don't know whether that attitude changes from year to year. A few years ago, Dean Keppel of uh, the education school asked me to make a study about the Armenians. Uh, I didn't do it for various reasons, but I couldn't do it because I don't understand these things. I wonder whether you could an answer it for us. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, in this sense, the American is everybody else. That is, <laughs> Armenian, then, you know, you 
you have in mind everybody who's not an Armenian. When you're speaking of the Italians, the Armenians are part of the Americans because they're not Italian and so on. So uh, when uh, you use the word American just as when I did, that's all it meant. Now, it is true that from time to time there have been people who have been intolerant different. There are reasons for that whenever that uh, kind of intolerance uh, shows up. But uh, without trying to explain why it shows up, I think it's in general exceptional and a temporary thing. Um, and uh, that uh, by their very nature, the Americans have to accept these differences because uh, that's what they are. They are a composite of many different groups. And uh, while I know that uh, sometimes uh, incidents such as you described uh, occur uh, and can have a great importance in the life of a child, I don't think that that is has been a prevailing attitude. Uh, for the better or worse, the prevailing attitude has been a one which accepts the differences, recognizes that not everybody is uniform and homogeneous, and in most cases thinks that it's a good thing. How are we, may I? How are we to have the young people who are insecure because they are insecure about everything else, how are we to have them communicate with those who have the finer attitudes so that they may bring not only to their own personal lives but to this great country what they can? What what sources, what ideals are we to quote them? When I'm abroad and they say to me, oh, you Americans are a mixture, you are nothing, nothing will hold you together, I say to them, oh, our ideals do, our ideals of freedom. But when I come home and I think that over, uh, I wonder whether I wasn't being chauvinistic myself. What, what channels can we into what channels can we direct the young people? Well, since I have a kind of commercial temperament and I'm interested in selling American history, I'd say let them study American history. That teaches the kind of uh, moral that I've been trying to point out. But I, I really don't think the problem is difficult in, uh, it seems to you. Uh, American culture in all its manifestations is always showing these differences. Its plurality, the fact that it consists of different sources. And anyone who looks at it honestly and becomes immersed in it will acquire a conviction of uh, a final question from Mr. Holliam. I want to address my question to Professor Hamlin again. <laughs> <laughs> my question is very much so. I'm going to be brought the question up. I'm going to reword my answer. I would like to ask Professor Hamlin if he has made a study or an observation of the change of the native attitude towards the immigrants. Let me uh, 
put it this way. First of all, that uh, you can't speak of the native and the immigrant. If you go back 50 years ago, you find that at that time there was open immigration. Uh, 1910, anybody who wants to come to America got on a boat and got it. Uh, and uh, immigration was uh, much heavier in size and volume than it is now. 1910, if I remember correctly, there were about 1,100,000 immigrants that came in that single year. Now, um, also, the immigrants were of all different sorts. Uh, they ranged from England to uh, Turkey, Asia Minor, Scandinavia, Africa. And when we think of this million people coming in a year, we have to remember it's made up of all these different types. Now, under those conditions, uh, there were some Americans, natives, who were hostile. They were hostile in different ways, in different grounds. Some people said we got enough, and uh, we just sort of say no more. Some people said we have enough of some kind, and there ought to be no more of some kind. For instance, uh, there were too many Catholics, or there were too many uh, Mediterranean other people who uh, said, denied this, said that immigration is a good thing, uh, that uh, uh, the old system ought to be uh, continued. I don't know how you would add it up uh, at that time, uh, because uh, in the end result, Immigration did continue free. In the end result, until the war, first war. And now, then there was a change. Uh, this, I think, is one of those periods uh, in which uh, there was uh, a reaction. And it may well have been that it was then uh, that Kim the died and the teachers showed their. Uh, after the war, there were a series of related things. Um, there was a year when four million people belonged to the Club of Clan. Uh, there were movements against the Catholics, against the Jews, uh, against the immigrants in general, and the old system of immigration. Uh, there were uh, efforts to restrict various other kinds of liberty uh, uh, and uh, uh, the defeat of the uh, League of Nations, uh, isolationism, and so on. It was a period of about seven or eight years after the war uh, when a whole range of factors combined to produce what seems to me to be a temporary change. And among these were the flight of immigrants, uh, along with the flight of a lot of other kinds of people. <laughs> and uh, it's in that period when you, that you have demand for 100% Americanism and conformity and so on. In that period also, that you have the kind of immigration law you still have. All right. Uh, but uh, since then, I think that there's been a return to the earlier attitude. And maybe that that you have in mind. If one looks, say, at the distance we come from 1928 to 1960, find a I think, I think, uh, radical shift.
shift back to the earlier atom. So the way to understand it, it seems to me, is to see in this that first post-war period a complex of reactions, part of which was dislike of anything that seemed foreign or strange or um, alien in any way. And uh, it's that that uh, has to be explained away, and that that's exceptional. I think since then, uh, the older and more consistent American attitude uh, has been maintained and has been developed. Uh, before closing, I should like to remind you again to get your tickets for tomorrow night's banquet from Mr. Young and Ms. Sarkisian. And I should like to thank our panelists for having tolerated an evening of such frustration uh, in the sense that, in the sense that we were unable to give them all the time that they should have had. The committee is quite... <laughs> and, and, yet, and, and yet, we are deeply appreciative of what they have done for us tonight in the manner of informing us and discussing with us their views on problems which are so close to our heart. Uh, and uh, Professor Varanyan would like to say a word. Now, as a member of the Board of Directors of the Law, excuse me, as far as I see, now I didn't want to see you that our intention here is to create schizophrenia. <laughs> not to split, split you from the organic function of our American public. That cannot be done psychologically, neither psychologically, nor sociologically, nor... But the idea is, we want you to absorb as loyal citizens to idealism, we're not speaking the name of all of them, as much as we can, we can have a magnificent culture. But, plus, the 4,000 years of tradition has been, and what is it, if not expansion of consciousness, realization of values that constitute some sort of your personality for higher fulfillment? Having here loyal to this country at the same time, never rejecting your importance. Thank you.